All right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, is that camera pointing correctly? <laughs> Last time I gave them a hard time by like walking this way and that way. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a path to accessibility, right? So right now, a lot of the internet is not accessible to people in terms of, you know, blind or colorblind or cognitively impaired. And there's various strategies that you can use to resolve that problem. Um, what we are trying to do here is to include accessibility testing into your acceptance testing so that you will have a better understanding of whether your app's accessible or not just by running your acceptance test versus running specific tools on specific pages and going through like lists of information. Yeah. And yeah, at the same time, we're improving uh, uh, your testing experience by making more ergonomic. And also, this is my GitHub handle, Billy Bongs, and that's my face, <laughs> my online face. <laughs> okay, so ergonomic testing, uh, ergonomic end-to-end -end testing. Uh, what does that mean, and how do we? What are the key requirements for it? So, firstly, we need our test to be stable. So, if we make a few changes to the way that our app looks our test shouldn't break. Um, and we want it to be decoupled from implementation so that we can actually write TDD. Right? If I get given a design, I should be able to write a test. If I can't write a test based on that design, then we have failed. Right? Because the whole point is that you shouldn't need to know how something was coded uh, in order to write the test to improve stability. If you are you, you know, bound to CSS, if you're bound to JavaScript in your testing, it's going to make your refactoring life harder. Okay, so what are the current approaches? So we have CSS selectors, right? This is the most power that you can have. You can literally select anything on the page that you want, uh, but it's extremely brittle. Like you may refactor your CSS, everything looks the same, everything works the same way, but your tests are all broken. And you must go back and you must fix all those CSS selectors in order to uh, fix your application and it's 100% coupled to, to implementation. So it's going to be really hard for you to write a test before you write the code unless you like theoretically plan or your whole CSS layout before you write any code, which is very hard, I think. Um, so the solution to CSS selectors was data test helpers, right? So what this means is that we Throughout our code, we can annotate it with like, this is data test uh, login input. This is data test image. Um, and then within our test, we just do data test selectors like this. And there's, you know, if probably a few, well, there might be some sugar around that, where you pretty much go data test save, and that will give you like the save button, and you can click it. Um, so this is stable, and it's sort of coupled to implementation, right? You can sort of just annotate in your head like, okay, this button is a data test save, this inputs data test login, this uh, image is data test test image. Um, and you can write your test with that. So you can do TDD with data test. Uh, but as you refactor your code, you've got to make sure that you bring those annotations with you. Um, otherwise, it will break. And also, I call it a vestigial annotation because it actually does nothing for the customer or for the user of the application, right? It's purely there for developers. And the first thing we do is we take it out the DOM, right? When we make for production, we just remove all data tests from everything. Um, so it doesn't really give much more other than adding some stability. Uh, then we have, I'm going to say Capybara style. Uh, Capybara is the testing engine that we use for Rails, where you can click the save button. So it's bound to the text, um, which is a massive improvement of uh, CSS. And so it gives you the same stability as data test helpers, as long as, when, as long as you decide that if my save button by accidentally becomes don't save, that's a bug. Um, so if you consider that a bug, then it's 100% stable. But if you don't consider that a bug, then it may not be so stable. Uh, it's probably 50% stable, I suppose. Um, it's not coupled to implementation at all, right? So you see a design, you can write your test. The problem that we've had with it in the past is that it doesn't always work. Um, like you try to do something, but you can't do it and you can't really extend it that easily. So you have to code exactly how they want you to code. Um, and also it's not available in JavaScript. So if you want to write a test without the server, 
So just the accept and says for your JavaScript code, you don't have that power. Um, and then the last one is page objects. So page objects is a pattern which can be used with all of these styles of selectors. Uh, but basically you have a file which describes a page and then you interact with your page by using that description. So instead of saying click save, then you'd have a function from like page object dot click save button. Um, and then you can pass that reference, that page object around and everyone can call it. And if you change the save button, you just change it in one place. So it's abstracting a little bit further to make refactoring easier. Okay, so I'm sure we all know the refactor process, uh, but uh, you do something which makes all the errors come. You fix the errors until your tests go green and then you're happy. Yeah, um, so this can also be applied to things like ESLint. You can activate an error in ESLint. You can fix some of them. Um, if you haven't fixed all of them, you can then maybe deactivate it. Um, or you can do ESLint ignore files. So, okay, I'm going to fix this whole folder first and then ignore the rest of the folders. Um, so that's sort of the refactor process of linting your code. Um, it's going to make sense soon. So with that in mind, um, so introducing semantic testing for JavaScript. Uh, okay, so what is it? Um, if we want to access a UI element in a test, we do so as if we were using a screen reader. Um, this was by an RFC that Jamie White wrote uh, for Ember. Um, and this is akin to the Capybara style and the decouple from, from implementation. So this is the basic rule that we apply when we do the testing and when we build the framework. Um, so previously we used to write tests like this where we use CSS selectors. Um, as you can see, you can get like pretty unwieldy and huge. Um, we connect ourselves to the JavaScript implementation. So if we change some JavaScript implementation, everything breaks. Um, we need to do introspection to find out like, is this the CSS selector? You, you won't be able to know unless you like dig into the code. Um, we have this, which is probably wet all over the place. Uh, but all in all, there's a lot of maintenance to do on a test like this. Uh, but with semantic testing, your test becomes like this, where everything that you're clicking and interacting with is uh, in the design and it's just the text, right? So you just click the button, you fill in the input, you click this other button. Um, so there's something interesting here, which is uh, requests, uh, server.track requests. So what this does is that when you click continue, all server requests during this period, while this promise is completing, will be tracked and then taken from Jest, it will be snapshot into a file. Um, and that way you expose how your application is interacting with the server um, as a byproduct. And instead of doing that other alert thing, we can just use a certain alert, which will find a, a, a element that's semantically an alert and we'll make sure that its text is this and that the CSS is that. Um, so we've trimmed down the code and uh, what we've done, especially in this, is we've asserted the semantics of the application, right? So if you try to fill in something that was not a, uh, an input, it would complain. Or if the way that your label was connected to your input was incorrect, it would complain. Um, if this was not an alert, it would complain. Um, right now, some of them won't work, like it won't find, so I cannot find this thing. Uh, but as we, what you'll see is very configurable. So as we grow and as we add more like code to this, it will get smarter and be able to offer alternative implementations, fallbacks, um, hints on how to fix your HTML. Um, and this is now connected to what's uh, the rule of uh, least power by Tim Berners-Lee. Basically, the TLDR of what it's saying is that if you build like a DSL, because it's a lower level language, you have the ability to understand from a code, from a code point of view, what's going on in the application and therefore giving you more power. Like for example, JavaScript uh, is a less powerful language than C, right? But because um, it's running in JavaScript, we can remove memory allocation work from JavaScript engineers and let only the C people deal with that. So, this is also now with semantic testing, right? So before you, you test with CSS, which is the highest power, but now you test with text, which is a much lower power. But in order to make that text work, we understand your application a whole lot deeper. 
Okay, so from inspiration of uh, lenses out there, uh, we basically provide uh, a, a rule file which you can modify. So for example, you can specify a preset, in this case like area compliant. Um, that means that it will only allow selection of area compliant elements and for finds an element that's not area compliant while doing the selection process and the finding process, it will throw an error telling you, oh, your label is semantically incorrect. Uh, you should fix that. Uh, but obviously, since we're starting from not semantically correct, and when it gets to semantically correct, we need a migration path. Um, and for that, there's a default preset, which uh, enables a few rules by default, um, like being able to find your elements using the name attribute, being able to find your elements by placeholder, uh, being able to support uh, semantically incorrect labels to inputs. Um, and what will happen is that based on your rule configuration here, the default rule configuration is that if, if you use one of those fallback strategies, it will just throw a warning. So you can look through your logs and, oh, this thing is, we should fix that, we should fix that. But it won't impede your development process. Um, you can build custom finders. There's an API for that. So to all the current finders use this API, including the area compliant finder. Um, so this allows for extensibility on that. And then actors uh, will, so basically you find an object and then you act on the object. So you find a button and then you click the button. Um, actors are for that. Uh, this is also for things like, for example, in Ember we use power select, uh, but with research that I've done, power select is not semantically correct. So if we wanted to support power select tomorrow, we could do that by making a custom, a custom actor for it. Um, until the point that we fix power select semantic uh, elements and allow this thing to traverse the semantic tree to act on elements, then we can remove the, the actor. So this API is just to help us get to the end, but enjoy the benefits today. Um, and it uses the same way that you do rules in ESLint. Uh, zero, one, and two as well. Okay, so this is the example that I've been using where you have a semantically incorrect label. So here we have a label that's uh, targeting a div. Now, labels only allow to target uh, form control. So the correct way was that this label should target this input. Um, and so when you run your tests, if you had it on uh, throw error, uh, if you had the configuration to throw an error, it would tell you that control login was found through the invalid label for relationship. Um, and then you would be able to fix that. But if you want to just be able to write your test and keep your velocity high, you can set it to warning where your test will... Oh, sorry. This was the warning one. <laughs> this is the warning example. So as you can see, your test passed. Um, so it doesn't stop your test from failing, but it allows you to find uh, your mistakes. And as you fix them, those uh, logs should disappear. Uh, but if, you, if your app was error compliant and you don't want to go back into broken, uh, you can make a throw error and then it will just inform the user that this is the problem and it should be relatively easy to fix. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is what the HTML should look like correctly. This is the correct HTML. And there's a lot of various, like the way you do tables, like how do you label a table? Um, how do you label an alert? Uh, yesterday I found out that if you put a area label on an alert, it will concatenate that label with this text when it's alerted to the user. So for example, that's one way or that's one mistake that people might make um, that this library can uh, inform them about when they, use, when they do the testing. So the current architecture of the package is we have the Ember Semantic Test Helper, which is Ember specific. So it's got blueprints. So when you go Ember install, it does some configuration for you, sets up a file with the configure function. Um, and has all the actors for Ember. And then we've got select semantic DOM selectors, which is the finding engine. So this is the engine that either throws an error or throws a warning or doesn't throw anything um, that iterates over the finders to find objects. Um, and this is platform agnostic. So hopefully we can get uh, a similar thing to this for React and Angular and Vue and anyone. It's absolutely platform agnostic. Um, QUnit semantic assertions allows you to do things like assert.input, my input exists, or has value x. So you're able to assert the value of your DOM without introspecting into the JavaScript. And obviously, this only works for QUnit. But what this does is it uses the finding engine, and it 
proxies all the found elements to QUnit DOM. Um, and then DOM da, QUnit DOM does most of the assertions. And we add a couple extra ones on top of that, which are more semantic specific. Um, yeah. Okay, so now I'm just going to go a little bit deeper into the code itself. Um, so here we have three of the main functions of semantic DOM selectors. You've got find objects, uh, find object, and find element. So what happens is that find object will just proxy to find objects. Um, find objects is a recursive function, if I'm not mistaken, um, where it will just uh, run, the run itself for every single uh, finding strategy that you have until the array is empty. And if the array is empty, it will throw an error and nothing found, basically. And if it finds stuff, it will just return to find object. And find object will assert that only one object was found. Um, and this is, I would say, these two are more low-level APIs. The more higher-level API is find element. Um, now, what's interesting here is that there is a label and type and method. So don't worry about method so much. Method is just uh, find objects or find object. Uh, but type, what it will do is it will go to... Oh, this is not working out for me. <laughs> there was a plan. Okay. Um, so as you can see here, we have defined this is what a button is. A button can be any one of these. Um, this is what a text field is, right? Any one of these things can be considered a text field. Um, any of these can be considered a toggle, even double check boxes. Um, any of these can be com considered like a select component. So these concatenations of uh, that we've defined up here can be considered form controls. So what we're doing is we're taking the semantic definitions of the web on the documentation, um, and we're just codifying all that information uh, in order to make this engine work. So what I would do is, if I wanted to find all controls, I would just say find element, uh, find object, and then the label that I'm looking for, or the text which identifies that, and then type being form controls then that would mean that any form control will be found with that. Um, I do have, right now, it's extremely coupled to your basic semantic must be correct, right? So it has to be, you know, an input or a role of input. Uh, but I have seen opportunities where we could find generic divs. So if you had a div labeled as my component, and that was meant to be an alert, if you went like find alert my component, it would find it and give it to you so you can do assertions on it and act on it. But also say, uh, the thing that I found for you was actually just a div. Um, and we recommend that you put role alert um, or use this semantic uh, element to describe this particular part of your application. Uh, so this is not built yet, but sort of my musings. Um, and same with the, on the Ember side, so this should say Ember semantic test helpers. Uh, but these are the functions that you use in Ember. So you go fill in, label value and what this does is it just proxies these things like type text type button type select uh, to the semantic dom selectors uh, these are various things uh, right now all documentation is in ember semantic test helpers uh, you can use this as a source of truth because as i move documentation from here to here there will be links uh, to guide people through Okay, so what are the key features that we've achieved? Um, for me, most importantly, is useful annotations, right? So we had data test selectors, which were useless annotations for users of your application. But now when we annotate things, we annotate things by using the ARIA specification or the accessibility specification. And this means that when a screen reader uses our application, it will work correctly. So we've improved our testing and we've improved the accessibility of our, of our application. Um, it's configurable and extensible. So unlike with the Capybara engine, like you can actually easily configure this. Um, and I hope to build and have people work with me to build like a large library of rules that we can use. Um, we completely decoupled from the implementation so we can get a design, we can write the test, no problem. And we have stability. Uh, because what well, we consider change of text a bug, but you could use translations. There, uh, there is some space for some work with translations here. Um, and we just need to know how that fits into the whole picture. Uh, yep. Okay.
So what success have we had from using this in TreGecko? So now we're reaching a point where teams can actually write uh, TDD. So they can do TDD behavior where we write the test and then build the application. And this will ensure that our whole application is tested. Um, like I mentioned before, we have useful annotations. And what's most interesting is that it sort of created a culture of what is the correct semantic of using uh, HTML and what is accessibility? How does that work? And now, because we're using this, it's a, it's a conversation topic, which at the end of the day um, allows us to build a culture where, where we produce higher quality web applications than we would have before. And for me, that is the best part of it all. Um, okay, so this is sort of reaching the end here, but so what's the roadmap? So we built a basic version for Ember. We extracted an engine. So the next piece is to build more rules, like the one I mentioned about, uh, oh, by the way, you used the wrong semantic for this element, um, to be able to understand uh, custom element semantic trees, right? So if you build like a custom select box, like power select, um, what does is, what is that correct tree look like? Because it's a couple of DOM elements which need to be all connected with specific markup. Um, and by understanding that, we can uh, create generic code which walks that tree and makes and, and can fill in any input on the internet. And if it can't, if that tree is incorrect, it can tell library authors, oh, by the way, you did this, you know, maybe you need to do this. Um, and this, if, as long as library authors can use a tool like this, when we consume libraries, our apps become more semantics. Like, it should not be your job to connect a label to input, it should be the job of a form library. And the form library should make sure that it passes the semantic testing. Um, and yeah, so just like usage, improving of the engine, and most importantly, feedback uh, for people that use it out there in the wild to like tell us or tell me like, oh, this is my experience, this doesn't work, this does work. Uh, and yeah, and then <laughs> still have this. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, any questions? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you please repeat the question? I couldn't hear it. Yeah, finders and actors, but I'm not too sure like what's the difference between their responsibilities. Okay. So the workflow is you tell Ember Semantic DOM select uh, Ember Semantic test helpers, I want to do this, like I want to click some text, right? I want to click this button that has a text or this element that is described by this text. So what will happen is it will use uh, finders. So IRA compliant is a finder, right? All of these rules are a finder um, and you can make custom finders and finders will have at least one rule, if not more. Um, so the first thing will happen is it will recurse over the array of finders until it finds an object and then it will do a notification on the object and then it will return the object and then uh, Ember semantic test helpers will then say, okay, any actors, do you want to act on this object? And then an actor will say, oh, I want to act on this object. Like for example, a uh, power select actor. We'll be like, okay, this object, I want to act on this and we'll act on it. And if no actors are found, then it will act on it with a default action, which would be the Ember click helper. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. Thanks. Make sense? Yeah. yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, yeah? I noticed that you have a CSS color assertion uh, in the previous slide. Oh. Does that work for like colors that I uh, define on the CSS? Like oh, this one. Yeah. So what happens is this will work on colors. This will work on the computer final CSS style. So if you have like 10 selectors mm -hmm. and like inline styles and they all apply in colors, like there will only be one that will win. So this is the, the one that will win will be the one that you assert on. Okay, so it doesn't have to be inline style. Right? No, 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 okay. it does not. It uses the JavaScript API. And so this assertion is actually done on QUnit DOM. So I haven't built this assertion. Um, all I did was build this, which finds the object and gives it to QUnit DOM to do a search on. So, like, so is like 
this library is it existing for other communities of JavaScript like this? Yeah. Um, well, existing right now elsewhere, not that I know of, but with the extraction of the core engine, there's pretty much no code in this file. Like 90% of the code is in this file. So the idea is that like, you know, for example, Selva uses React, he can build this for React. He can build this version for React by using this and write almost no code. Um, so ideally I would like this to be in more than just the Ember community. Actually, I want to do that. Yeah. So this Maybe I'll learn Angular and. <laughs> 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 okay. Anything else? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Shall we start? Okay. Uh, I'm Selva, and you can find me at Selvax in the social networks. Uh, I build stuffs at Tegeco, MJS stuffs mostly, and uh, so, uh, on, the fun, on the free time, I build some React stuffs and Angular and some React Native as well. So I mostly believe on inspiring, getting inspired from the cross community culture, like getting the best from different communities and put it to work. So today I'm going to share something about profiling Ember apps that uh, we did like a few months back. Like uh, we faced a, a huge uh, memory memory performance problem in TedGecko, and especially that that was found that was actually blocking our test cases to run. Like it, our test cases never ran to the till the end. So we uh, we did some profiling stuffs. We spent some uh, like few weeks on it to actually uh, drill down the memory problems and we fixed it. So today I'm mostly going to share about it. So performance, like for every software developer, we want to ship uh, performant apps, right? So it's also an inherent feature that every app must have. Like failing to deliver it so will, uh, will cause our users to churn, especially. Uh, also, in addition to that, performance penalty is going to cost us more in terms of maintaining it. Like we have to work around it whenever we face uh, performance problems. Also, we have to uh, fi fix fixing performance problems is also quite costlier. So, in JS world, like uh, we uh, the performance itself is a huge topic. Like I try to categorize uh, into two major categories. One is the load performance, and the other is the runtime performance. So when it comes to load, uh, load performance, the two important metrics are time taken to first meaningful paint, which means uh, uh, we, sh we show the users some meaningful content, uh, so which will increase the perceived performance. Like they, when, they load up, when they load our app, they feel they, they don't want to see a huge spindle loading for a while. So they just go to see a, get, a, get to see a meaningful content that's uh, rendered on the screen. In Ember world, like, we can employ uh, fastboot to achieve this. Like you, you can render the HTML on the server and serve the HTML to your browsers. So the second metric is time taken to first meaningful interaction, which means uh, when you when you when you deliver some HTML, when you deliver some content to the users, the next step would be obvious. They will try to interact with it, right? So to in, uh, for the interaction to happen, we have to load the JavaScript bundle. Uh, so mostly in Ember apps, the JavaScript bundles are quite huge, right? Uh, so we need to actually split the, split the Java, huge JavaScript bundles into multiple bundles. Uh, right now, we have the Ember community has the Ember engines, which is, which is quite experimental, but still uh, you, you, you can able, you, you'll be able to split the huge JavaScript bundle into multiple chunks so that you can actually lo uh, load the critical JavaScript piece to uh, give the f fastest interaction as possible. So regarding the runtime performance, so the two important metrics I could see is like uh, the rendering one. So whenever the user users actually uh, play play around their app, the experience should be quite fluid, right? They shouldn't uh, feel any junk junks while uh, playing with your app. Uh, so the goal is to have 60 frame, frames per second. So as us, as as front end engineers, uh, we uh, we should like avoid expensive DOM rewrites. Re like which causes reflow and repaints because those are going to affect our frame rates directly. So the second one is memory monitoring. 
which is like we tend to neglect quite often because uh, uh, J because JS takes care of most of the times. Like even the, our frameworks takes care of most of the time that we of, uh, we almost neglect the memory monitoring stuff. But that ne that neg uh, negl neglecting that is actually costed us a lot. So before diving into it, like I just want to give a snapshot on what is memory management, right? So when we load when we load our JS apps, like everything go goes and sits in the in the user's memory, user's system's memory, right? Like the the code we ship, the data we load, the objects we create, everything is going to go and occupy some space on the RAM. So it's quite important that we don't uh, we don't cross the we don't reach unusual limits uh, in the in, our, in the user's uh, in the user's device. So the most of the uphill task is taken is taken care by JS engine, right? Unlike uh, low-level languages uh, like C, uh, which allows you to, uh, which forces you to uh, actually uh, allocate memory and free memory when it's not used, uh, JS engine here does does the job for us. Like it, it creates, it allocates memory when the object is created, and deallocates it when the object is not used anymore. So, what role we we do have here? Like literally nothing. But there is some role we have, because uh, it's uh, like avoiding some memory leak mistakes like we we often tend to uh, commit some mistakes that prevent the javascript engine doing its own job like holding references to the dead objects that's not not needed anymore right so so javascript engine actually co collects the dead objects uh, via a special program called garbage collector so but garbage collection happens at a cost like when a, when a garbage collection happens like your Entire app freezes for a while, nothing runs. So it comes at a high high cost, right? So so usually how the garbage collection works is like it starts from the root 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 object root scope, and it it traverses deep down and uh, and mark all the objects that have references as a uh, live objects, and objects which are not live are considered dead and are not used anymore. So uh, browser decides when to have when to actually trigger a garbage collection. It it it, it is based on numerous factors like the memory of the device also sometime so there is no actually uh, defi uh, definite way to say th this is when the, the garbage collection happens so so the problem we cause here is the to hold the reference of the dead objects from being collected by the uh, garbage collector so that's called memory leaks like the few symptoms of memory leaks are like if your app is started to perform uh, quite badly over the time, it means that you are actually leaking some uh, memory. You are having, you are actually holding some references to the dead objects, which are meant to be like garbage collected. So if you, okay, so that's a, one of the symptoms. And also, while working with JavaScript objects, you have to make sure that you don't create more objects than necessary, because that would that would uh, force the browser to trigger the garbage collection. Uh, quite frequently, which is not, which doesn't come at a free cost, right? So where to start to profile memory manager? So the best tool is like uh, Chrome's Task Manager. So I use Chrome as a primary uh, browser for my, for my development. So Task Manager gives you a uh, overview of how much memory your tab each each in Chrome like each tab is an individual process, right? Uh, so Task Manager gives you a overview of how much memory each tab actually consumes. So that should give like if if, if the if that number is uh, unusual, like if it's uh, if it's spiking to more than 500, 700 MB, then something is wrong actually. So the next handy tool is memory allocation timeline. Like this one uh, is a part of uh, Chrome Dev Tools. Uh, you can find this under the memory tab. So this is this gives you a live timeline. Like you can record a timeline and play with the play with your app. It shows when the memory is allocated and the memory is when the memory is freed, freed up. The ter third tool is like a heap snapshot. It's actually a subset of the memory allocation template at a specific point of time. So either of these two should suffice the same name. So before actually the show uh, showcasing a memory profiling, I want to share a few tips. The first one is like. Uh, don't try to fix a problem on assumption. Just try to uh, identify the exact leak the, uh, that you anticipate. 
so that uh, you can actually measure your output. So before profiling, use incognito mode or guest window uh, so that your add-ons or extensions doesn't actually uh, intercept with your memory timeline. Third one is try to, uh, so Chrome DevTools has a uh, forced garbage collector button. Try to do, uh, garbage collect before actually taking a snapshot because that will uh, cause the uh, JS engine to collect the data objects. So, which means you have less thing to take care of. And this is the important thing, like uh, everything on the snapshot is not a leak. So as I said, like whatever you do, uh, it's going to occupy some memory on your uh, device, right? Like you create objects, you load data, so it's going to sit on memory. So everything on memory are not leaks. So in Ember world, uh, you, you would like to, you should actually inspect for objects with a destroyed flag. So Ember marks the objects are destroyed if it's not being used in, uh, anywhere anymore, anywhere inside the framework. So that's actually the key to the uh, profile the Ember apps. So I have one, one, one quick demo. I'll just show to you. Okay. Here. Yeah. So I have this app, which is just a list. And it what it does is just a model with the details and cancel, nothing else. So Let me try profiling this one like memory. So I do, I let me refresh the app. Okay, all done. So this is the memory tab. You find two things, heap snapshot, and uh, this is the timeline of the heap snapshot. So I check that. So I, I, I forgot to <laughs> initiate the garbage collection. So let me initiate garbage collection, click it, start, then let me do the normal actions usually the blue bars the blue bar indicates the amount of memory that's allocated during your course of action and the gray bars is the amount of memory that gets filled out like so in an ideal world you should see a lot of gray bars instead of blue bars so i let me perform one action this one let me perform a few times so you see that so whenever i click a model you see there's a spike in blue bar so an object is created, which is fine, but when I close the model, the, that that component is destroyed. Like it, should, it, it is not required by the app anymore. So ideally, that should be flagged for garbage collection. But the gray bar is like not the full. Uh, it does, it's not. It doesn't match the blue bar, right? So there's obviously some memory leak over there. I just stop the profile. I click on the blue bar. You find a stack on that particular instance. It's quite hard actually to profile everything. Like that's why remember uh, performance penalty is really costly. It's going to be time consuming, and lots of you need more patience over it. So I directly uh, inspect the classes arrays or like native arrays. Like there, there will be like the stack is filled with system calls, system arrays. Like there will be tons of information that you don't need. That's totally unrelated to your app. So, so here that. Uh, I directly go to class because our components are actually classes. So you see here, I uh, had to hover, hover over here to actually see what class is that. Directly, you can just inspect the destroyed flag. To, so if you find that this object is destroyed, then it's meant for garbage collection. But we are still holding the reference reference to it. And that's the reason uh, it's not free up. So we, ha we, we have to find the culprit which holds a reference and we have to like fix it so this one looks like an input component which uh, which i had inside the model so uh, if you look at the code so this is the code i had you can see cool so this is a dialog component hbs so when i click on the button i just render a dialog with the customer form in it and if i open the customer form you have those inputs on it so the customer form on a whole it doesn't have any uh, js code yeah, so there are less possibilities that this one leaks memory so the main possibility is like the parent component is not actually dereferenced because of which the child components are also stay stays in memory for a while so if you check the parent component i have a uh, event listener 
on key down and i have a i try to remove the event listener on destroy uh can anyone spot the what the problem is here why it's what is the actual line that actually holds the reference of the component even after it's destroyed is this code correct like uh, did i try to remove uh, remove the listener in the right way The reference to the address of this is to the reference to the new dependency. So the point is, yeah, you're right. Uh, you, I know you agree, <laughs> but this is like you know the answer before. Uh, I have discussed this like a lot, lot of times with you. Okay, it's fine. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so add uh, add event listener and remove event listener. Okay. Uh, so I try to register a function like uh, I try to register a handler on key down. By and I try to remove the handler uh, when the component is destroyed. But the culprit is like uh, I do uh, to have the this context on the handler. I do a bind of this. But what uh, JavaScript bind function is, does is like it returns it binds the context and returns a new reference to it. So it's not not actually equivalent. Like the one you register is not equivalent to one you unregister it. So eventually you didn't you, you didn't you didn't unregister the right handler. That's actually causing a memory leak. So, right fix is to just copy this, have hold the reference somewhere. This dot underscore close model. Fun. And I have this here. Remove this here. And I unregister the same handler. So, ideally, this should fix it. Check again. So I let me refresh it. Uh, clear the existing one. Trigger garbage collection. Start. Like let me try. So it's trying to at least uh, remove most of it, right? So the the least part is like something related to detached DOM, which which is totally a different topic. Like uh, there's one more leak called detached DOM, which means uh your DOM references still hold somewhere and even if, even if it's not actually part of the render tree or the DOM tree and this is not actually a problem with our code this is actually a problem with the ember itself like uh, they are, uh, there's an active discussion on discuss.emberjs.com regarding this and it is intentional and it is not meant to be like long lived so these will be uh, you can ignore that safely if you inspect that you can actually find it what's actually holding that okay not possible here I just do a snapshot at this point. So if you check for detached DOM, you can still find like that's being hold. So the red red color red background says you that this node object is being held uh, by uh, some other objects. It's not. It doesn't have a direct reference to your code. So this one is mostly like if you dig in, this one is like the stack trace is huge. Let me try to have a small one. Oh man, this is also huge. <laughs> Everything is huge. Fine, leave it. Just ignore, ignore this one. Uh, I, I can link you to the discussion that uh, that's going on in, on this aspect, and it's probably it's probably not a fault in, with our code. It's good, it's good for now. So back to the presentation. So I just want to share uh, it's, it's one, just one of one pattern that uh, can cause memory leaks. Like there are like few patterns I could uh, we came across in our Ember, Ember, Ember code base that I wish to share. The one first one is the pro, pro, prototypal leak state leakage. Uh, this means that you have class components, and you, which means uh, it, the comp the components gets instantiated when, whenever it's rendered, right? So leaking the instance state into the parent class which means uh, any inst any instances that are cre created henceforth will share the same state of the previous instance. So I'll show some code maybe. This one is the event listeners leakage that we just fixed it. Uh, third party li libraries. So it's quite uh, common that we want to use some, uh, some existing third party plugins because we don't want to build everything from the scratch like reinventing it is not ideal, always. Uh, so when it comes to uh, jQuery plugins, it totally falls out of the Ember lifecycle books. Like it's, uh, they have the own APS to create instantiate, they have the own APS to destroy it, right? So 
uh, when integrating that into Ember component, we have to make sure that whenever whenever the component is destroyed, we have to make sure that we destroy the third-party libraries as well using the APIs. The reason is like uh, third-party libraries can have li event listeners uh, attached to the DOM or anywhere for the plugin to work. So the they probably they ex uh, pro the probably they would expose an API to destroy those event listeners. And the next one is having set timeout, set interval, run, run later timers. So it's quite, uh, there might be use cases like we want to uh, schedule a callback. Maybe like we want to refresh the exchange rates of your app, like you want to fetch it like every uh, 30 minutes, maybe. Uh, we have to make sure that when, when you move out of the route or when, where you don't need it, you just cancel those timers. Otherwise, that time, the handler in those timers might have the scope of the parent. Like we used to use this dot something, do something. Then this is like a scope of the parent, so which, get, which gets leaked to the, until the lifetime of, of, of your app. Uh, module scope leakage means uh, right now we, we, we use JavaScript modules a lot. And this one is like having a mutable JavaScript uh, module level constants, co co constants at the top of your file. So we can avoid that because that's because it, it's the same. It has the same effect as the first one, prototypical state leakage. Like having any shared object over there is going to be uh, reused among all the, all the objects in the same file, right? So module is evaluated once per lifetime, like once per, when it, when the JS is loaded. Global, it's quite obvious. Like we don't want global variables to stick around throughout the lifetime. Let me show some code. So this is the first one I saw. I mentioned the prototypal leakage. So that one is a bad piece of code. Like uh, whatever you put inside the extend is going to stay inside the prototype chain, which means it's going to be shared among the instances of the component. So we have tags as an uh, non tags as an array, which is a non-primitive data type. So we have an action called add tag. When we when you try to push object to the uh, tags array, it gets shared among the different instances of the same component. So to fix it, uh, use init hooks to instantiate the instance properties don't have it on uh, prototypes in the in the class syntax it will be like static so in class syntax it's quite explicit that we uh, we don't end up in writing static but in this one this syntax it's not explicit like we end up having this kind of code throughout so the next one this is one that we fixed like the event listeners try to remove it appropriately uh, Third one is the jQuery third party. Like we, we integrated select ties on a text field, uh, on didn't sell element, but what we did wrong was to remove it on when the component is destroyed. So make sure that you destroy via the destroy API of select ties. <coughs> this one, the same thing like the set timeout. Uh, if you have some set timeout uh, timers on your app do, that does something, and we, if, it, if, the, if it has a, this context, which means this is the component itself, it's going to leak. Like, Unless you remove the uh, handlers via clear time or remember dot run dot cancel. So this is the module level example. Uh, don't have any mutable data at the module level. That's totally a bad practice because uh, if a mutable data is modified from one of the component instances, it's going to be affected on the other components as well. So never do that, uh, and never don't use globals as well. So fixes to just use the instance uh, instance level properties on in it okay almost at the end summarizing like uh, don't set as a thumb rule don't set non primitives on prototypes because that's going to cost state uh, instance leakage plus it is it will bite us uh, heavily on test cases because uh, when you run the same component integration test multiple times you're going to have this chat state between your test runs uh, second one this is quite a good rule like don't pass the entire component reference or controller reference around the app like we do this, like uh, we create a component and pass the controller to inside the component, which is not required. Like we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, why a component should know about the entire controller, which controls the state of the template. So the solution is to use yield APIs, uh, yield, yield the public API of your components uh, via yield and hash helper. Third one is clear the time intervals, uh, all the timers, even listeners and third party libraries. Uh, final one is not actually a uh, memory leakage problem. It's like a more of memory optimizing uh, point. Like don't create objects unless it is necessary. Uh, also don't increase the life, the life cycle of an object because 
more the objects is there, then uh, it would bloat the memory and would trigger garbage collection, which is not free. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Any questions? And more, impo uh, more importantly, this is not applicable only for Ember apps. It's like framework, framework agnostic. At least about that point, like do it for JS talks. So the pattern applies for everything. Any questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that's a good thing, but uh, I'm not listening to the key down of the component. I'm listening to key down of the window. Ah, okay. okay. But using key down of the components doesn't need. You don't need to unregister it. Yeah. Uh, when does the garbage collector decide to actually start collecting next of the app? Uh, no idea. No idea. No. <laughs> I just said uh, it, it, it. It's. Depends on various factors like the device RAM, the de device RAM, the available space. It's really not defined, so you can't say that this is the time it's going to collect. Can you manually call the PC? Yeah, with Chrome Developer Tools, yes, not via programmatically. Any other? Yeah. Um, have you profiled React apps? <laughs> 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 Haven't faced many problems with React. <laughs> Anything? Oh, cool then. Thanks. Okay, I don't know how many of you actually.